It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Yes, a good wait. <laughs> and it smells. Oops, steady. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Good morning, my lady. Good morning, Parker. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Whoopsie. Come on. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. <laughs> They'll be worthy winners. <laughs> And valiant losers. <laughs> Will it be the high road to glory? It's about winning. Or the low road to disaster? Pop, pop! This is the Antiques Road Trip. Nice! It sounds like the 70s. It's a sports car of the 70s. It's an old bloke who was young in the 70s. It must be another Antiques Road Trip! But... That's a fresh face in the passenger seat. Hello, new expert, Izzy Balmer. Everyone's a winner, baby, that's true. Um, auctioneer, dealer, Izzy? Au auctioneer, auctioneer. Um, I work in an auction house in Wiltshire. Oh, lovely. Well, welcome to the Antiques Road Trip. Thank you. And don't let her you fool you. What she lacks in experience, she'll more than make up for in enthusiasm. She specialises in jewellery, and watch out, she is a woman of many talents. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> I've got somersaults going on in my stomach. When I first told everyone that I was coming on Road Trip, yeah. everyone was really excited for me and really yeah. pleased. Yeah. And then they said, oh, who are you with? And I said, yeah. oh, I'm with James Braxton. Awesome. Um, they dampened. Well, no, <laughs> no. They're enthusiastic. They started chuckling, chuckling. Just chuckling, laughing. And then they said, oh, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> James Braxton is a veteran road tripper and former owner of two auction houses. How he had time for all that with all those long lunches <laughs> is a mystery. Is the champagne on ice? Yes, and the foie gras is in the fridge. This isn't like any other show. You've got to spend. Go large. Yes? Go yeah. large. James, is this an actual genuine tip? Or are you telling me to go large because you're hoping I will do so and then I'm going to absolutely bomb? No, this is, this is, <laughs> this is no bums, dear. <laughs> no. Talking of bums and steers, how are Izzy and James finding their fabulous 1978 MGB? Good one. Good one. Izzy, I think you're going to enjoy this car. It's My only concern is it's a red car and I have red hair. That's all right. I don't think you'll clash. Doesn't clash? No, okay. no, no. Little touch of orangutan. <laughs> Jane, what are you saying? Lordy, time to send him back to charm school for a refresher. Izzy and James each have £200 in their piggy banks and will be travelling the byways of England's eastern counties. They'll wind west and then north before a final auction showdown in Lincoln. Have you thought about your approach to the road trip? Do you have a plan? Sure, I've done. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just hoping that I walk into a shop and the items just speak to me, that they really? call me to them. The link with the past. Well, here in the present, they'll be competing at auction in Tring, Hertfordshire, after they've scarred the antiques emporia of the counties of Suffolk and Essex. And the first port of call today is the town of Woodbridge, eight miles from the sea, with its lovely harbour on the River Deben home to one of the last working tidal mills in the land. Time and tide wait for no man, though, and James is being dropped off, and our new girl is getting behind the wheel. Watch her. Izzy, it's all over to you. Remember, buckle up, spend your money, and don't crunch the gears, OK? <laughs> See you later. Take it away. Oh, irritatingly <laughs> smooth. Woo! <laughs> Time for our suave antiques expert to wend his way to the first shop of the trip, Woodbridge Antique Centre, which has a fine array of shiny things. Come on, James, show us your metal. In a sea of white silver, here we are, we got something of gold, and that sort of glitters, doesn't it? It's unusual, but who uses a toast rack? People with class, like me. Anyway, I'd better get Natalie over. Natalie? Yes? I see you've got a rather optimistic price tag here. <laughs> Would you like to have a closer look? <laughs> <laughs> Can I have a closer look? Now, there we go. First of all, we want to test its weight. It's light as a feather, this right. one, isn't it? <laughs> a silver gilt, so it's not gold. £65. I don't know. Why do I like it? I'm not a clue. <laughs> anyway, that is food for thought. What price could that be? I'll have to go and um, speak to the dealer and find out what we can do on that one for yeah. you. Yeah, if you do that. That's all right. While you're doing that, I'm yep. going to continue. You do that. 
And meanwhile, we'll catch up with Izzy, who's made her way west to Needham Market, a town which flourished in the heyday of the medieval wool trade. The woolly ones may have gone, but the former gravel pit, which was flooded to create Needham Lake, is home to many feathered friends. Our new bird, though, is on her way to times past antiques, which looks very promising indeed. I wonder what will catch her beady eye. I'm in my first ever road trip shop, um, and so far good. I'm really impressed with how much variety there is, but I'm also really indecisive as a person, so this could be interesting. Oh dear. But yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Of course it will. The world's your oyster. Ah. Uh. Huh. I like this and I don't like it at the same time. It says a hound, I mean, it looks a little bit more... I'm really not an expert on dogs, but to me it's maybe a bit more labrador or something like that. Um, anyway, we'll go with hound for now. What I don't like about this is that it's silver-plated and it's not in the best of condition, so you can see the brass coming through, particularly on the back here. It's a Vesta case, which, while smoking's really out of fashion, Vesta cases, when they're novelty Vesta cases, can still do really well. What I would really like this to be would be in silver. It's only silver-plated. Um, ooh. The hinge is a little bit wobbly and feels a little bit stiff. It's definitely far too expensive for me at £38.50. I'm going to think about it, maybe if I can do some really serious haggling on this one. It's a possibility. Think on it while we see how things are progressing in Braxton land. I, I like these. these I know, they're really fun, aren't they? Lots of bright colours. So this yeah. is a wooden fellow mm -hmm. here, and it's sort of ply, so it's a laminated wood there. And then you've got these rather nice sort of fonts, numbers here. And what mm -hmm. is it? Commencing top left-hand corner, range numbers 1 to 15 across the board. Do not lift the numbers out of no, the box. you have to slide, slide. Yeah. So you slide them like yeah. this. This is a sort of... Uh, this is a, a one-dimensional Rubik's Cube, isn't it? I think that's quite fun. It's £8. I'm very happy to pay £8. Yeah. But um, did, you get a, did you get a price on the yeah. toast rack? Yeah, we can do that one at 40 Sold. Lovely. Thank you, Arch, Thank indeed. You. Eight for the puzzle and 40 for the toast rack is £48. Yeah, £50. Pounds. Good start for James, but how's our indecisive damsel doing in Needham Market? She's called in owner Pauline. I have just spotted this really rather lovely Iona silver brooch. Um, it's in a style that we'd call a target, a target brooch. Yes, target brooch. Um, I love the Celtic decoration going on. I probably shouldn't be telling you how good this is because then you're not going to give me any money off it. But it's um, a nice piece. But I'm going to anyway. So Iona Silver is really popular. It's very collectible. It's it is. Market. What I don't like is that we've got a little bit of damage. So we've got a bent pin here. I really need to buy something. So with that in mind, can you? Can do, we do a deal? Can we? Can we do Please. a deal? Please. We have twenty-eight on that. I think we could do a deal at twenty pounds. Perfect. 20. That was easy. Do we have 20. a deal? We have a deal. Excellent. And what about that Vesta case with the fine hand? Not as fine as Bobby. Steak. Don't bite. It's ticketed at £38.50. I've got my fingers crossed. £25. OK. £25. I've fallen in love with it. I keep thinking about it. Do you know what? I don't think I'm a gambling person, but I'm going to gamble. Let's go for it. Jolly good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hurrah! Duly divested of a total of £45, 20 for the brooch and 25 for the Vesta case, everyone jump for joy. Thank you. Meanwhile, James has made his way to one of England's most ancient towns, Ipswich, and surely it's time for a brew. James is with Colleen Seymour, headed for her pub and brewery to hear about the centuries-old tradition of women brewsters or alewives. So, lady brewers new to me, but historically not new. They're not new at all, no. They started way back in the 5th century. That's the first documentation of them. Wow, that's yeah. early, isn't it? It's very early. Why so much ale when we're told today it's bad for you? Oh, it's got its nutritional value. Yeah. Um, but the main reason was for the fact the water was dirty. And so if you just boiled out all of the impurities and disease, then obviously there was more to drink and less people died. So beer is good for you? Very good for you. All things in moderation. 
on to Colleen's microbrewery for more of the story of how brewing, once part of women's domestic chores, developed into a means of economic independence as the ale wives produced ale for sale. Let's go back. So you're, you're a lady brewer in Norman times. You've been conquered. Presumably they brewed in something larger than this. It they? would have been much larger than this. It probably yes. would have taken up most of their kitchen really? for the high production that was needed. Yeah. Um, it, was quite, it was a very simple process. That's why alewives were great at it, because they used to use their kitchen skills. Basically, you would boil it up to get yeah. rid of the impurities and get rid of the diseases. Yeah. And then you would start to put in ingredients such as your malts. Then you would put in some hops. They would ferment for about a week. Occasionally in the summer, where there's no control, you would get a bad batch. When was the heyday of ale wives? Around the 15th century, and as brewing became popular, to signify who was actually doing well, they used to wear a hat at market. Goodness, yeah. The taller the hat, the richer the ale wife. It was a very profitable business, so obviously everybody wanted to compete with each other. Yeah. Like the hat, but I, I see you've got another uh, associated accessory there. What's that? It's a broom. Not just any broom. This is called a besom broom. This basically signifies when there's a new brew available, and the brew houses used to put this outside so people knew to come and buy their ale. And together, the cat, the hat, the broom and the cauldron are the archetypal symbols of witches as depicted in Western fairy tales of the last few centuries. And they are always wicked. God, it's all adding up now. It is. We've painted a picture. We have the bees and broom, we have the pointy hat, we have the cat. And you also added another thing, the wart. The wart. Yes, I'm actually thinking maybe that the wart that we actually use in brewing is what people now think that witches have warts. So folklore put two and two together and made 186. Yeah. <laughs> From the late Middle Ages, a dangerous climate of superstition and misogyny doomed many women to accusations of witchcraft, often for little more than being odd or opinionated, administering herbal remedies or having offended the wrong person. In 1641, Suffolk-born self-appointed witchfinder general Matthew Hopkins began a murderous purge, denouncing women Brewsters as witches and subjecting them to persecution and torture. Witches went to trial, yeah. or so-called witches went to trial. It was a no-win situation. They'd tie you to a chair, throw you in the river. If you sank, you were innocent. If you floated, you were guilty. Oh, poor them. So, in this climate of fear, presumably other lady brewers took off their hats? They did, yes. And so what happened to brewing? It went underground, basically, or it just became more dominated by men. Yeah. They took over. Is, is the hope for the lady brewer now? You're, you're spearheading a revival? I hope so. There are quite a few lady brewsters in Suffolk and all over the country, and we run our microbreweries quite efficiently. And do you all get together? No, actually. Over... <laughs> we need to get together over a cauldron. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Would be. <laughs> Who'd like to try my brew? All hail to the lady brewer. Either Colleen's cast a spell on him, or he's had one witch's brew too many. <laughs> Probably the latter. Hubble, bubble, toil and trouble. <laughs> it's time to catch up with Izzy now. How's she feeling about her first day's toil? Is she in trouble? James has been doing this for so long. He's so experienced. But who's to say that the new young woman on Antiques Road Trip can't take James Braxton on? Ah, that girl. Fighting talk. She's off to her last Antiques Emporium of the day in the village of Copdock, where she has her sights set on Suffolk Heritage Antiques and Reclaim Centre. Oodles to see here. I should put that on the car and hoot it. So you should. Another item that's really popular at auction at the moment is morning jewellery. This one has this really lovely engraving around the edge and this is reminding the wearer of the death of two people in their family. I like the darkness about it. I like the sadness about it. I like thinking of the people that would have worn this about their loss, about what they were feeling, about their life, who they were. It's just, it's something quite personal. And I like the stories that items tell, and morning jewellery tells a story. You just have to look at it. 
Oh, she's a sensitive soul, this one. But the damage is just a little bit off-putting. Time marches on. What's she going to buy, then? I quite like this chair. It's a beautiful bit of ash. Georgian. I'm probably pushing my luck a bit here, but slightly arts and crafty with that back there. There's just something honest and rustic about it that I love. The ticket says it's late Victorian, priced at £59. I said I wanted to buy something big, and this is big, and it's a lot of money. I might not make a huge profit on it, but it's... Uh, do you know what? I just love it. I can see wear there. It's got a stain here, which isn't actually a good thing, but it's got a story, it's got a history. Think who sat on that. Think how many bottoms are sat on this chair and what they were thinking and who they were and what they did with their lives. This is over 100 years old and it must have seen so many different things. I just don't know what's not to love about it. I really, really love it. I think I've got to have it. Well, that sounds decisive. Yeah. Try your luck with the shop owner, Richard. Hello, oh, is he? I've spotted something. This lovely, absolutely very horrible, not very nice chair. No, I'm joking. Um, this lovely chair. It has got a ticket price of £59. 59 mm. I can get you to 54 54 If I go any more, I'll have to speak to the dealer. Would you mind? No, I can do Could that. you be an angel and speak with the dealer? OK. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, Miss Determined as well. OK, Izzy, I've spoken to Helen and she said the best she can do is 50. 50 pounds. I'm going to do it. Okay. Yes, please. Thank Lovely. you very much. Thank you. So, 50 pounds spent to finish a first day of fine purchases. Better get you some cash. Let's call it a day and pick up James. How's the horn going? Ooh, like oh, like that. Yeah, I can like rock that. up. It's lovely, <laughs> lovely horn, isn't it? At one with your motor. <laughs> that was good fun. I, yeah, I reckon a good long stretch and we could just zoom. Zoom on. First star on the right and straight on until morning. <laughs> Nighty night. Day two and our lovely couple are braving the elements this morning in Essex, where they're hoping to add to yesterday's treasures. I must confess, I'm yet to find the bargain. The leg winner. The leg winner. Do you know what? I think I might be in exactly the same position. I followed your advice. Yeah. I bought big. Bought big. Well yeah, done. Bought big. So I've spent half my money. Well done. That's very good. Half your money on three items. That's good. But well, one of one of my items is eight pounds. Okay. So I've got I've got to spend up because otherwise I'll I'll, I'll look rather embarrassed, won't I? Well, you haven't really followed the advice you gave to me. Never trust the competition, is he? Yesterday, she couldn't resist a lovely ash chair. I'm going to do it. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. And she also fancied an Iona silver brooch and a Vesta case, so she hits the road today with £105 left. James was dazzled by a silver gilt toast rack. It's unusual, but who uses a toast rack? Apart from me and he also toyed with that cheap vintage puzzle. So he's still flush today with £152 left to spend. Izzy, what are you hoping to find today? Um, a, a diamond, diamond that is... Paste. Paste. That yeah. the, the, the owner thinks is paste and I know is a diamond. That is what I'm hoping to find today. Well, that's easy. It'll be right next to the Fabergé egg. First stop this morning for Izzy and James is Halstead in the Cone Valley. And this lovely wooden clapboard building is Townsford Mill, dating from 1788, originally used for corn, then later for silk production. Today it houses Halstead Antique Centre. Look at that. Some stock here, isn't there? There is. I can't even see the end. Well, you're spoiled for choice here, the pair of you. This looks like James. <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky monkey. Or do I mean orangutan? Right! Be serious. I've spotted a Victorian brooch. It's kind of carnelian and it's kind of agate. And I know that sounds really confusing, but they're one and the same stone. They're all varieties of quartz. It's priced at £28 and, and it's not hallmarked. So that is... That is 
ugh, it's, pri it's pricey for me. I want everything cheap, don't I? I'm having an internal dilemma in my mind because in the same box, we have got another agate brooch. And this is a bar brooch because it's sat along the bar. This one is also in white metal. It's probably silver. Um, again, it's of a similar age, sort of late Victorian, early 20th century. And women would often wear these as, as lace pins. So they have those very high, frilly, lacy collars on their blouses. And this would, this would sit here at the top. I mean, this one's priced at £18. So again, expensive for me. I'm wondering if it's worth trying to do a deal and get the two, or I'm not sure if, if that's a good idea. And then thirdly, third internal dilemma going on in my mind here, we have another Victorian brooch. While it isn't a hallmark to silver, it looks silver. We do have a, some maker's initials, but we also have a little bit of damage, my favorite. Again, it is a really typical Victorian design. So this isn't uncommon, it's not rare, but it appeals to me. I, I think perhaps I just like Victorian jewelry. Not kidding. If I was to get all three, what do I want to buy them for? I want to buy them for 30 pounds. That's less than half the £60 ticket price, but I salute your ambition. Over to Dealer James. Can you give me a couple of minutes? I'll talk to the dealer. Of course. That would be super. If you could pull on his heartstrings. It's my first road trip. I'm against James Braxton. He's an antiques dealer. He doesn't have hearts. <laughs> <laughs> They've got to be in there somewhere. Go and amuse yourself while the man does his job. Classy top hat. You have to hold it at the front the way you want to wear the hat. And then, I have terrible hand-eye coordination, by the way. You then have to roll it along your arm and onto your head. So, wish me luck. <laughs> Something like that. Ta-da! Ta-da, indeed. How's James's quest for that leg-winning item? Nice bit of olive wood. Very Mediterranean. Carry on, sir. What news on the brooches? Can I squeeze you any more on that? Okay, don't. Okay, cheers. That didn't sound promising. No. The best we can do is 50. 50 pounds. Mm. 16 pounds off. That's not too bad. I have a horrible feeling they're going to make me no money whatsoever, but I love them. I think, I think I've got to have them, really, haven't I? You do, don't you? Thank you very much. 50 pounds. She's fairly dispensing with those notes today. Good work. Now, how's Mr Braxton faring? Well, these are always fun. Victorian sampler. And they were worked by generally ladies at home. And then we got the verse, and the verse is called The Maiden's Choice. Be this my fate if ever I'm made a wife, or keep me happy in a single life. Oh, that, there's a slight touch of doom about that, isn't there? At £90, I'm just going to look for an alternative. <laughs> Is it that time of year already? Bravo! Maestro! What do you say, lovely bowing? What is it, how, how do you refer to a violinist? That sounds good to me. I'll take that. You'll take that. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? How are, you, are you buying it? No, no, I just saw it and thought I'd have a little, little fiddle. A little fiddle. <laughs> yeah. Well done, well done. Music masterclass over. Those antiques won't buy themselves. This is a really lovely Victorian woodworking plane and it's got some really good age and patina to it. It's got these lovely brass fittings and it's by a maker known as John Mosley and he was prolific during the Victorian period. He made loads of different types of planes and woodworking tools. It's ticketed at £68, so I'm going to see if the lovely James can do me a lovely deal on it. James, we meet again. I've discovered this Victorian plane. Mm. I have a slight problem. I only have £45 left, and it's ticketed at £68. Do you think that's going to be possible? I'd do it. I think that'll be all right. Thank you. That's fabulous. Thank you very much. I like her style. She's almost spent the lot. And off she goes with the spoils. Come on, James. Keep up. One, two, one, two. Now, this image has real presence. Look at it. And I can see we've got um, highlights in this, which is tin oxide. The white is the tin oxide. It's very, very well painted. And if we were looking for something value for money with real presence, 
Uh, it's signed by the artist here. £35. That seems quite good value to me. More attractive than the sampler at £90? James, now can you help me? I have a quandary. I hope so. I, I really love this bird of prey. Uh huh. And I think it's well priced. Uh, what, what price could be done on that? I can do it for thirty-one fifty. Thirty-one fifty, finely priced. Thirty-one fifty. Mm -hmm. You can't do it for thirty then. Round numbers. <laughs> mm, depends. Depends. <laughs> I'll do them both for hundred. Do them both for a hundred. That's tempting. So rather than helping me with making up my decision, you're now throwing me into confusion because you've ten tempted me further with the joint deal, haven't you? Very cunning, James. Very cunning. Deliberately so, wasn't it? Well, I'm a gambling man. I'm going to take you up on that. That means 75 for the sampler and 25 for the watercolour. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, they're spending big today. Time to take off. Izzy's off east to Colchester now, an ancient centre of Roman power with a long and colourful past. But it's the story of tattooing which is drawing her in today to the flaming gun where art historian Dr Matt Lodder is waiting to flesh out the origins of the West's interest in this body art. I mean, tattoos are basically as old as people are, right? As old as humanity itself. There's pretty decent circumstantial evidence of tattooing right back into the Neolithic. So we find things like figurines, which have marks on them, uh -huh. um, which could be tattooed. There are mummies of a similar age from Chile. So we've got this kind of global practice. It can be religious, it can be kind of marking coming of age, it can mark status. It seems to be this kind of fundamental human instinct, like one thing that unites everyone on Earth is that, you know, all culture on Earth, they have some kind of skin decoration, cultural instinct somewhere. In Britain, the Dark Age Picts of the east and north of Scotland were tattooed. Their name is understood to mean painted people. But at Colchester's St James's Church, Matt has an example for Izzy of how the modern Western tradition of tattooing emerged with the rise of Christianity, when, in the centuries following the Crusades, tattoos were a mark of holy pilgrimage. How interesting. Tattooing has a long history in the West, and if we want to go right back to kind of birth, of a Western tattoo tradition or a, uh, the presence of tattooing on the bodies of, of Western people, the best place to start is in the early modern period, in the early 17th century, with pilgrims. This looks like, you know, a contemporary footballer's tattoos, right? It looks like it could, could be David Beckham, but this is more than 300 years old, um, and it looks like it could be on a premiership footballer today. This is a nice, rare example in the Holy Lands in the middle of the 17th century. There's the date of the pilgrimage, 1669, very important for memorial purposes. And then on this arm, we have this narrative scene of the um, crucifixion, um, resurrection and assumption of Christ. King Edward VII followed in the footsteps of these earlier pilgrims by visiting the Holy Land in 1862 and returned with the cross of Jerusalem tattooed on his arm. Never knew that. Just like kids today who go on holiday to Magaluf, Pilgrims who were going to Jerusalem and Bethlehem would come home with a tattoo. Partly to show off and, and partly as a, as a mark of devotion. In the 19th century, interest in body art from the Far East grew as Westerners flocked to Japan in the 1860s after it emerged from a period of political isolation. The Japanese tradition of tattooing was turned into the height of Western fashion. In fact, the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, spent seven hours being tattooed with this dragon in Nagasaki in 1891. Never knew that. In the 19th century, everything Japanese is fashionable. Silverware, um, cloisonnier, lacquerware, you know, textiles, everything Japanese is cool. And tattoos are part of that. George V, who was a future, a future king of England, he got tattooed in Japan in 1881, and he was part of this broader trend, and everyone thought, right, that's the cool thing to do. I want a cool Japanese tattoo. Some very daring women got in on the act, displaying their tattooed bodies in circuses. And to meet demand, the ancient method of puncturing holes with needles by hand was replaced by new technology, operated like this Victorian doorbell. 
And it's one of the first um, electronic devices, electric devices, that was converted by tattooists to be used as a tattoo machine. And this is a modern tattoo machine here, right? You can see, basically, it's exactly the same mechanism as this Victorian doorbell. An electromagnet with an alternating current that makes a, a armature bar go up and down to move a needle. And it's the same as this Victorian doorbell, right? It's exactly the same. And this you know, basically meant that tattooists could produce many more tattoos in a day. It'd be quicker, probably far less painful for the clients, actually. And that really drives the popularization of the industry. So as lower class people uh, got more interested in tattooing, those kind of very refined high-end um, uh, members of the aristocracy and um, captains in the army, they got less interested as, as technology made it more accessible. I can't help but notice you have got a tattoo, especially for our visit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the show, I have to say. You know, <laughs> Antiques Road Trip is right there on my fingers. <laughs> Maybe that should be my first one. Do it. Do it. <laughs> I'm not telling you if I've got any. <laughs> Let's catch up with James now, ambling along the Essex B roads. What I've bought so far would decorate a small room, really. Uh, all I need is a chair and a table. Who knows? I've got one more shop. And the last pit stop today is 20 miles southwest in the village of Turling at the charming old Dairy Antiques. Hello, James. Hi. Patrick, nice to meet you. Good to meet you, Patrick. What might he unearth in this rustic emporium? Oh, look at that, a lovely pot as well. I remember these from school, they're great. And you see, electricity and modern convenience makes everybody lazy, but you used to get that spinning there and you get a foot on the treadle. So you can feel the pot growing, it's growing, it's growing. And then you're bringing it down, you're making the hollow. You know, who needs to go to the gym? Make a pot. Look at him, feeling the burn. Look, here, here am I, sort of, I'm moving hands. I feel like a sort of one-man band. I'm, everything's going, but lovely. I think a lot of people have converted these to electricity, but this has got a fabulous flywheel. I don't know what the, the potter's stance is, but look, you're just, just working it very gently. Not exactly Patrick Swayze, is he? If I could buy this, it, I would definitely buy it, but I haven't got a lot of money, and I'd imagine... Patrick wants a little more than I have to give him, but it'd be such fun to take to auction. It'd be such fun to own. I really like this. But it'll depend on the price. Patrick, I think I'm becoming in total unison with this item here. I can't seem to get my leg off. What is your price, Patrick? Uh, it's 125. 125. That's up for, yes. Yeah. Well, normally, if I'd had 125, I would have given it to you. But I think we're, we're too far away. See, the potter, you know, what we sacrifice for our art, clean pair of shoes, spoiled trousers. Lovely. Carry on pottering inside. Here's a, a branded box, here, there and everywhere. Players, please. So this is of a bygone age, this is cigarettes. This is a box that would have contained lots of packets of cigarettes. It's got a, a, a sort of naval hero here. It probably tells you all about it here. We've got a consignment label. And it says, from John Players and Sons, and it's rather helpful, the invoice is dated 1956. Examine with care. If this package is damaged or short in weight, write to the delivery agent and manufacturers immediately. There's no telephoning here. There's no emailing here. There's no texting, it is writing. No ticket price either. Over to Patrick. That is £35. Pounds. £35. Pounds. Yeah. Is there any movement on that? There is, yeah, we could do that for 20 for you, best price. 20? 20, yes. I'm not going to be in an unseemly rush, but at £20, pounds, I'm going to take the player's box. Thank you very much indeed. No problem, perfect. James, your work here is done. Time to collect your companion and carry on getting acquainted. I have particular weaknesses. I can only imagine. I like things with three legs or, or octagonal sides. I'm, trying, I'm wondering what this tells me about you. I have nothing further to add. See you tomorrow, guys, after some shut-eye. Tring, 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 hello? Is that the Hertfordshire town? 
just to warn you that there's an antiques road trip on its way to Tring Auction Market and James and Izzy will be vying to get ahead. So, first auction. Yes. Excited? Yes. But a little bit apprehensive, if I'm honest. Oh, rubbish. You bought some nice items. You'll be all right. Maybe she'll thrash you. Izzy embarked on her maiden voyage, determined to spend the lion's share of her £200 on five lots, and she did. I rather like Izzy's purchase here, and at £20, I think this is definitely a profit. James, meanwhile, parted with £168 on his five lots. Do you know what? I, d I don't know if he's going to make money on this. I mean, it'd be absolutely great if he made a loss. That would be brilliant. Hmm. <laughs> you can but hope. And what does our auctioneer today, Stephen Hearn, think? The toast rack, when I first saw it, gold, at a distance, I thought, good. Then discovered it was silver gilt. But still, it's a very nice example, and that will sell quite well. The favourite item is the ash and the oak chair. That, I feel, is my favourite today, and hopefully it will sell well. While Stephen gets his gavel and the bidders muster, time for our experts to take a seat. Have you seen as well what oh, the no, Doomsday. Said. The clues in the name, Doom. Fingers crossed. <laughs> First, will James's cigarette chest light up? When did you last see one of those? £20 pound for it? Tenner? Yes. 12 15 He started to start. £20 pound now. You won't find another one. 22 in front, 25 at the back. 25. 28 now. I've got butterflies no. for you oh, in my stomach. There you go. <laughs> I'm selling it then for 25 pounds. 697. Yeah. 25 pounds. It's wow. worth it. A teeny one. It's true. Five, you know, this competition 50, is not about washing five, faces. No, 50, it's yeah, about no. winning. <laughs> well, maybe Izzy will be on a winner next with her doggy Vesta case. 30 pound for it. 20 pound for it. 15 for it. Yes, 18 I've got. 20 for the Vesta, 22, 25. Are you eight? Yes, 30, no. Oh. Uh, 28 pound then, yes, sir. 28. The Vesta at 28 pounds. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Well done. 31, you made a small profit. Made a small profit. Small profit. Small profit. Small profit. Small profit. Good. Good doing well. Inch my way up. Yeah. Creep up. Long. The only way is up. Good start. What an initiation. <laughs> <laughs> Next under the hammer is James's sampler. Will it be a maiden's choice? Anyone got 50 for it? 40 for it? Yes. Oh. Yes or no, sir? 40 bid. 60 I'd bid. One more? No? It's OK, then. It's worth it. Your bid, surely. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry, James. <laughs> what a shame. No gloating, Miss Sincerity. That's a shame. I've got to... I feel like Doesn't I need matter. to be supported now, cos otherwise no, Karma's going to come back and bite me when it comes up to my last. Well, we'll see what the Hand of Fate deals you next. It's the turn of your woodworking plane. What about £40 for it? £30, £20? Got to be 20 to kick it off. It's going 20 the wrong way. Minutes. What's happening? Five now, oh, 25, 30, are you five? Got 40, this. are you? you are? Surely, one more 40 I have. More. 40, I, more, yes, more, 40. More. 45, more, 50 more. is it? <laughs> at 45 pounds, away it goes at 45 <laughs> then. More. I should set it Anyone? away then. You've got it, sir, for 45 pounds. Thank you. Oh. Radio, That's all right, isn't it? That's profit. I paid for it. What, did you pay 45? Mm. OK. okay. Uh, it's not as bad as I thought it might be. Sadly, it will be a loss after auction costs. So you're pleased? Well, you're pleased. Uh, relieved. 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 <laughs> I've been pleased with the profit. Ah, let's see if James's wooden puzzle can square the numbers now. Who's got £30 for it? £20, 20 bid, 2 bid, 5 bid, 8 bid, 28 in the middle. This is baffling. 30 to anyway, me. 28, then it's going down for £28. 143. 28 pounds, that's all right. 20 in, the, in the old box. In the pocket. I can't believe it! That's like a crisp 20 pound note just being popped in. More than doubled his money. Well played. I am shocked, James Buxton. I'm not. He's a sly old fox. Time now for Izzy's trio of brooches. 20 pound bid at 25. Two of you, 30 bid. Five, 40 bid. At 40 bid, I bid oh, one more, so no cheap. more five. More. 45, 50 Keep pound going. now. You're getting uh, 45, there. if there's no up. further bid, you've got more. them. They go. No, another one. 45 more. pounds. Thank you very much. <laughs> Izzy's getting oh. desperate now. <laughs> I've made a laugh. What, what, what was that? 45. No magpies in Tring, it seems. 
Somebody's got to be a winner, somebody's got to be a loser. I can see where this is going. <laughs> it is inevitable. Popping up now is James's silver gilt toast rack. There you are, not ancient, but a very nice oh, look, quality it's one. There we are, £60 for it, £30 for it, £35 for it, 40 iron bid, 5, 50 bid, 5 bid, 60 bid, 5 now, 70 sir, at 65. Madam has it at £65 then. It's I'm going to sell it for 60. £5. That's fantastic. Five, five, seven, That's well really done, fantastic. Well done. 65. Oh, I bought it for 40. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I bought it for 60. No. <laughs> he must be having a senior moment, but he has enough wits to make £25. That's great. Oh, that's good. I'm really pleased for you. Well, maybe she'll catch up with her Iona silver brooch. 15 bid, 18, 20 bid, I 2 bid, 1 more, 5 bid, 8 bid, 30 now, at 28, 30 oh, yeah, now. £28,000. Yay! <laughs> 28. Another small profit. <laughs> okay. Steady work. Steady yes, work. steady work. Indeed, a sterling effort. I'm a tortoise, you're the hat. So I've done an early sprint. Yes. Now I'll, I'll have to stop for lunch somewhere. <laughs> and then you'll just <laughs> treacle along. So treacle along. <laughs> yes, our James is quite the gourmand. Let's see if his watercolour of a bird takes off now. What? Likes it. <laughs> 20 for it. 530, 540, 550, 560, 570 now. <laughs> Madam, no. Take, take away with one hand and give with the other. It's going at 65 pounds. That's more than double That's your right. money. Braxton's back. <laughs> Braxton's back. He was never really away. <laughs> and that was one high flying bird. Well done. You're like a falcon yourself. You're rising and then swooping down. Swooping down to kill. <laughs> Into kill. Well, that sounds like it's me that's the prey here. <laughs> Your last chance now to make a killing yourself with the oak and ash chair. Ought to be eighty pound for it. Eighty pound, fifty pound, thirty pound, five forty, five fifty bid, five sixty bid. Five seventy bid. One more for you, sir. Uh, oh, seventy like pound. Five now. Seventy pound. Then it's going. I shall sell it. Yes, you have it. Well done. It's well going done. For seventy pounds. It's very good, is it? Well done. Right. <laughs> Not her first today, but her biggest. Good work. Well, we go and do the math. Well, I might take that puzzle and we can do it on that. <laughs> I'll do the math, James. Starting with £200 in her piggy, Izzy made profits on most of her purchases. But after auction costs, her porker was slightly leaner, with nevertheless a very respectable £187.12p. While the seasoned James fattened up his piggy and, after cell room charges, weighs in with £231.26, taking the rosette this time. Well, I'm going to save for that moment. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> well, it, it'll be short-lived. Don't worry, Izzy. Put it In, here, James. Inevitably, I will lose. So it's just a matter of how I lose. Well, you need to do a better job of losing, then. Onward, ho. <laughs> Next leg.